Good morning again. Good morning. I'm going to be going into several scriptures, but this morning, most of it's going to come out of John chapter 15. I told the wife I did not realize, and still I started writing this, some of these attributes of God. Now, we've talked the last couple of weeks. Let's see, first week was God was a, was a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Last week we dealt with God as Father. This week, God gets to be a gardener. Think about that. How many of you like to garden? My wife tells me all the time, I don't know why you want to spend so much time out there. I enjoy it. It's my brain relief, it's my head relief, it's my, I like to play in my garden. <laughs> I don't have 5,000 acres to plow up. <laughs> so, so it's not like a job. I bought a raised bed garden kit the other day and I can walk all the way, oh, it's neat when stuff's planted this high and you don't have to bend over. <laughs> so there's ways to do it. I don't think God's ever had a bad back. But as I glance through the word of God, just glancing through, just picking out scripture, just looking about what the Lord would have me to say today, we start in Genesis. What's God? It's Gardener. One of the first things he made. I said, thought about that. Wow, right off the bat. He's playing in the dirt. We're told how many times in the Bible to be fruit bearers. Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. Well, there's a bunch of them. I'm just touching on some of them. And I thought about how much God must love working in the dirt, because guess what he made you out of? You're a mud pie. <laughs> And then the scripture says, God breathed in man the breath of life, listen real close, and man became a living soul. <coughs> we didn't become a living being, we became, we became eternal. Well, I've had people say it to me all the time. Well, well, preacher, you know, you're gonna live forever. And I love to grin at them and say, and so are you. While we're walking on this earth, we get to pick the neighborhood we wanna live in. <coughs> Abraham said, I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. I'm picking my neighborhood. How about you? If you haven't picked it out this morning, we need to talk. And if you have, stay on the road to get there. I think about the parable of the sower and the seed. So much points to God as... I read verses... The other day, and, and seriously, I've read the Bible through several times, and so I know I've had to have read it. I was reading something the other day, and I stopped and told the wife, I said, what's this? And I read it, and I reread it. I had to study on a verse that I know I've read many times. And I was like, that's cool, because that's what I like to do. I want to get into here. I want to see what it means. Reading over a verse and not knowing what it means means nothing to you, and it's not going to change your life. But let me tell you something. If you want to get into it, the Word of God will change your life if you let it. I am what I am today because of a lot of different reasons, but one of the most powerful ones is the Word of God. Now, when you're dealing with Jewish people, they're going to talk about Torah. They have a whole ceremony, some chop Torah. They go through the whole thing thanking God for the law and for His Word. You see, they look at it differently. When you have a Torah scroll, they look at it as that is the Word that spoke something out of nothing. Do you believe that? A lot of people think that God took this and made this. He didn't have to take anything. He took nothing and by the power of his word, he spoke something into existence. And when we really deal with the word of God on that level, if we get that in our head, that will change your life. To know that what is written here is for me, it is eternal. How many of you know the book? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will last forever. But anything God's ever said, it's not going anywhere. I caught myself years ago in my prayer life. I quote scriptures a lot when I pray. 
When I'm praying alone, I quote scriptures a lot. And I thought about that one day. I'm that weird guy. And I thought, okay, you know what I found out? I found out God did not need to be reminded of what he said. I need to know what he said. And when I'm quoting scriptures, guess who I'm talking to? I'm talking to me because heaven's fully aware of what God said. So when we pray, lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. Who's that for? God knows he said it. By his stripes we are healed. Who is that for? That's for me. That's for you. God doesn't need to be reminded. So as we get into the word of God, let's sort of adjust our brains that we're looking into something that brought this world out of nothing. And he breathed in man the breath of life. Man didn't become a living being. He became a living soul. You have a spark of God in you that is eternal. And it's going to live forever somewhere. John chapter 15. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Anybody know what a husbandman is? It doesn't mean he's married. He's a gardener. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, well, I like this part, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them in the fire. They are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Now, all of us have some kind of different background. We have the way we were raised, what we were taught. I said this, talking about God as Father, prayerfully. Uh, in some things, we know a little bit more than our parents did. And in others, we don't know as much. We lost something from them, and we gained something in our own generations. And that's how it works. There's complete books written. Look them up on the knowledge of your grandparents, your great-grandparents. They're great books. There's stuff they knew that we don't because they needed it, and we don't. We got Kroger, Giant Eagle, a &P, whatever else is out there. Barking Market. That's my wife likes those Barking Market. We got all of them places. And when it's getting to be dinner time and you have no way to a store, don't have a store, guess what? You had better plan it last year what you're going to eat this year. But they understood that. They got it. They got it. You see a truck going down the road and he's going. 54 to 55. What's wrong with him? He needs to be out of my way. I can't pass him. There's a hill and there's a curb. There's cars coming. And you don't realize inside of that truck is what you're going to go to the store and get. And if he don't make it, you don't make it. And we sort of lose that in translation sometimes because it's not what we want. So if God is the gardener, he's going to prune. I remember my grandfather growing grapes, and he had never grown grapes. Now, they were great grapes. They were good grapes, and the grapes are everywhere. But every year, they got a little less. They got a little smaller, and they got a little bigger. And a fella happened to come by that grew grapes at raised growing grapes and he was going to give him a hand and when he was done I thought he had killed everything in the place and he cut and he chopped and he guess what we got next year we got grapes lots of grapes <coughs> melt the paraffin pour on top of them cannon jars put the lid on your head <coughs> When you make your first jelly sandwich, you're going to get a little paraffin because you've got to break it up to get it out of there. 
But somebody knew what they were doing. And what they were doing was taking off something that was not going to produce fruit. And see, in each and every one of our lives, folks, we got stuff that's not producing fruit. We, we got stuff in our lives that is not doing anything toward the kingdom. How many of you ever done any investing? What most people do is when it starts going down, sell, sell, get rid of it. And you don't realize very shortly it's going to go back up and may supersede what you had. And you got to look and you got to see. Well, see, I'm dealing with somebody who's not speculating. He's not looking at a market scale. He knows what the future holds, folks. And if you want something good in your life, you start depending on him. And I'm not saying go home and get on your knees and say, Heavenly Father, what should I invest in? Not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is in our lives, we, we really believe that Jesus is coming. We need to be looking at what can I do to fulfill what God placed me here for? What can I do? How can I better achieve? You see, that sort of comes up last. If I got any time left over, I'll work for Jesus and that, that's a bad mentality. See, I've seen things happen in people's lives that thought that way, and it was things that they could not handle. They were things way beyond them. Now all of a sudden you're on your knees all day long, all night long, and you're seeking God and you're looking to Him. Why? Because it's something beyond you and you know you need Him. But not so much when our bellies are full, all my kids are healthy, and I got money in the bank. And if you want to develop a prayer life, I tell they, the board will tell you, some of them are sitting here, how many times have I said in board meetings, we are in the most dangerous place this church has ever been. We got money in the bank, we got heat in the church, and the light bill's paid. That's the most dangerous place you will find yourself because then we cease to pray. We cease to look at God for his leading, his guiding. We're not looking at what's coming at us. We're just looking with what we got. I read about it all the time. They, they want to do, they want to go to the digital dollar. Go ahead. Help yourself. Do whatever you want. Guess what? There's stuff written in this book. I cannot change, folks. I can pray fast. I can glow in the dark. I'm not changing anything that is written in this book. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. But if they go to the digital dollar, you know, they can control you. They control you now. You just don't know it. I have one freedom, Heavenly Father. I have one outlet, Heavenly Father. I got one place to turn, Heavenly Father. How are you going to feel? You've worked your whole life. and You don't get Social Security. You don't get a retirement. You don't get Heavenly Father. And there's ways that we can pray, but it's a whole lot easier to do it now. Honestly, in my life, I have no problem saying I got it made. I get guys that say that to me trying to offend me. Holbrook, you got it made. I'd say I don't have it made, I'm blessed. And I agree with it. I got a fantastic life, and God has given me everything. But if I got nothing, blessed be the name of the Lord. I got to fix my brain and my heart to that now. Because if I wait till it's all gone, that's hard. I'm not saying I can't do it, it's just hard. So what does God do? Anybody ever see a tumbleweed? Okay, and it's good for what? <coughs> Writing songs. <laughs> that's all it's good for. There you go. So what can happen? Before it dries up, before it breaks off, before it starts blowing around. If it's in your yard, I don't even know what a tumbleweed looks like that isn't dead and blown. But if you water around it, if you put some fertilizer on it, if you trim the limbs, if you, guess what, you can keep it alive. You can keep it, you don't have to be like the rest, blowing down the road. You can do something with it if you care to do something with it. If it's something, you, my wife one year planted some wonderful flowers right in the middle of the yard. Oops. <laughs> they accidentally got mowed over. <laughs> Mike told me to do it. Gotta blame somebody. 
Now the idea is, what is a flower that's not planted in a flower bed? It's a weed. That's all it is. It's free weed. It's just a weed. And so what do we put flowers in? In a flower bed, see? It's not hard. We put tomatoes in a bucket. So God provides. He gives us what we need to grow. He gives us what we need to learn. And sometimes learning's hard. And sometimes the lessons are hard. But if we learn, we can go on to the next lesson. If we learn, we can go on to the next lesson. And we sit and we look. So we get pruned. Now I thought about it many, many years ago. If plants could talk. Honestly, um, whatever you do in your life, help yourself. There's people that are vegetarians. There's people that do the keto diet. There's people that do, people that do. Whatever you do, help yourself. But, but I get people, I don't know how you could do that to that cow with them pretty big brown eyes. If broccoli could talk, you know what they would call you? Bad name? <laughs> Asparagus? You can have my chair. Okay, I'm, I'm easy. I'm just, just help yourself. Now, would you eat asparagus? If I'm hungry enough, you don't nail it down. I'm eating it. I am that guy. I'm not going to turn anything down. I don't like a hungry belly, but I've got my favorites, and that's not toward the top of the list. That and cottage cheese run real close. And some of you love it. You know what? That's good. But it's all meant for our good. Every bit of it. It was given to us by the gardener that we may grow. Now, if you have a blessed life, you get to pick and choose what you want on your plate, right? Don't cook something you don't want. That just doesn't even make sense. If you're going to take the time and the effort, we're going to go towards things that we like. And we do the same thing in our spiritual life. Well, what makes us feel good, what makes us, that's where we want to go. This is why, and, and it's sad, you got ministers out here saying, send me $100 and I'll pray for you. Send me 1000 and you'll get a miracle from God. People want to flock to that. Why? Because that makes you feel like you're in control. If I give enough, I'll get enough. God cannot be bought. I'm not going to say that enough. God gives to whom he will. You're not going to buy him. You're not going to buy him. What are we going to do? We're going to walk before him to the best of our ability. Now, God provides what we need to grow. The first thing you're going to need to grow is his word. I came to the Lord. Raised in church should have known a ton of things I did not know. Just shows you how much attention I paid. Came to the Lord, young man. Got into the word of God, began to grow. Began to grow. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. Faith in and by the word of God is one of the cornerstones of who we are. How do we even know how to behave, what to act, what to do? How do we know any of this if we don't have the Word of God? I haven't shot anybody in a very long time. And I read a verse in here that says, Thou shalt not kill. So I went, ah, okay. I don't take stuff that doesn't belong to me. Guess what I read in there? Thou shalt not steal. See? It's pretty easy, huh? Don't covet, don't commit adultery. Start them out right off the top. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And that is one of the greatest failures of a blessed people because we start looking to the blessing instead of the blessor. We start looking at the product instead of the gardener. The guy that's given us all this stuff, the guy that grows it around us, the guy that blesses us, we don't look to him enough. We're looking to the stuff that he's given us. And we think that's when we're blessed. Mentioned in, in Sunday school today, um, you're just a young man, you're coming out of high school, whatever else. Uh, guess what you consider a blessing? Your wallet. You got your job, you're working hard, you're doing what you ought to do, so right here's my blessing. You get up a little older, you got children down here and a wife and a house payment, and you're looking at your life, and you're thinking, I'm blessed. Everybody's, I'm blessed. You start looking like this. I got all my teeth. My brain works sometimes, my back's okay. And right now my health's not too bad. 
and I'm blessed. And so you see how blessings change with their mind, with their age, with their health. What we think is a blessing, it's all a blessing. And God has given me all things. But what I key in on, I, I read the report one time and I had to go back and reread it. That one of the leading causes of bankruptcy in the state of Ohio was health care. Health care. People work their whole lives and they save and they do and they build. Then all of a sudden, I owe what? For what? And you sort of shake your head. Heavenly Father, <laughs> here I am again. And I'm dealing with things I can't control. <clears throat> but the word of God will change your life with you later. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Now this, fellas, I'm going to talk to you just a bit. Because the verse starts out husbands. <coughs> husbands. I'm looking at all of you. It says love your wife. Did you know that was a godly command? It's not a request. Husbands, love your wife. Well, Lord, you ain't married to her. Do you understand what she is? <laughs> None of that's in here. That was a Holbrook translation. It says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I have told more than one young man when I got ready to marry them, if you're not willing to die for her, you don't deserve her. If you would lay your life down for her, then that is somebody for you to have. If not, and I'm talking about without question. Well, you know, if I don't do something, people are going to think I'm bad. No, that's it. <laughs> without thought, right here, I will get between you and trouble. This is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. And you'll not lay a hand on it. And we have to think that way. So here, let's go on. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, and that it should be holy without blemish. What is all that saying? That's saying by the word of God. My brain was not good when we first got married. I had more baggage, more junk, more stuff. I think about that, and I'm honest. If 18-year-old me would have walked in and sat down, I wouldn't have liked him. He's not a good man. So how do you get all of that stuff out? You scrub it out. Washing of the water of the word. The word of God will get in there and it'll start picking all them little cracks and crevices out. It'll get stuff out you don't even know is there. And you can start getting rid of the baggage because guess what God's going to give you? He's going to give you his. And you know what I like about God's baggage? Oh, the word is so powerful. It says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. My baggage wait a time, folks. I was a mean man, and I understand why. I can psychoanalyze myself at this age, and I know what piled on me my whole life and maybe what I was, but Jesus Christ has taken that. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. And we gotta get that part. I can't carry this stuff over for all of these years and everything else. People wonder why, why people dropping over with heart attacks and all this, they're, they're carrying way too much baggage, folks. The Lord himself said that his burden was light. Didn't say he didn't have one. Said he'd help you carry it. Anybody ever watch uh, horses, oxen, anything in a yoke? Mules. I've seen mules. I've seen a lot of mules in a yoke. And if you got one mule, and this is where the mule skinner has to know his job, you'll get one mule, and if he's a little older, a little smarter, You'll see that yoke ease up. He'll get about half a step back. He stays with the other mule, but he ain't pulling them. Now, what's that mule skinner's job? He takes that rein. He goes, walk. Get up. And he'll pull up. And he'll carry his share of the load. You go down half a field or maybe a turn or two, and then all of a sudden, uh, he starts backing up again. And, oh, no, no. And if you whack him hard enough, he'll quit doing it. And we see it in our Christian lives all the time. I see it in families. I see it in all kinds of places. 
where somebody wants somebody else to carry the load all the time and every now and again, let's go. You've got to take your share, and you've got to do what you got to do, and the Lord will take care of us. Now, we got the root, we got the word, Matthew 5, 14 to 16. I know a bunch of you will know this because I was here when you sang it. Are you ready? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. If you hadn't sang, he was going to lead the next verse. <laughs> I watched you sing that for a week. Now, a bunch of you, you've done a great job. Now, the idea is of Matthew 5, 14 to 16, it says, you are the light of the world. Where'd you get your light from? Are you that? Honestly, we, we it was funny. Uh, it's my 50th year class reunion. Everybody was coming in, and some of them had been cheerleaders, and some of them had been majorettes. One of the guys ran over, and he says, we're going to have a chair tonight, aren't we? So me, I'm standing behind him, and I start going, S-P-I-R-I-T. And they're all looking at me like, yeah, that ain't happening. <laughs> so cheerleaders. Well, the problem is, and I, I joke about it all the time, but uh, I say, well, I used to be cute, but look, the cute wore off. The cute, it's just silly. No, it's not cute anymore. You are the light of the world. A city that set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. They put it on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, our roots, they begin to receive power from the Word of God. We get watered by the Spirit of God. And if we're planted in the sun, as so then, we get to grow. We get to grow. Things are going to come out on you that you didn't even know was there. You're going to say things, and I'm not trying to be rude because the only reason I'm saying it is because I've done it. You're going to say things that are smarter than you. Oh, seriously, I've been in messages two or three times, and so give me just a minute. I was writing something down I just said because it wasn't in the notes and it was way smarter than me. I'm going to use that again. That's pretty good. So what is that? That's God moving through us. That's Him speaking to us. That's us yielding ourselves to the Son and bearing fruit. And you're going to say stuff that's smarter than you. And we're supposed to. We're supposed to. Now, when you're not planted, you turn into a tumbleweed. I was thinking about it. Pride, greed, wrath, envy, lust, gluttony, and sloth. And those are the seven deadly sins. Oh, they'll teach you at seminary. Oh, it'll be so much fun. And each one you can branch off and it goes into other things and other things. But that's all the main categories of what sin is. And it starts off with pride. There was an angel standing before the very throne of God. And he said, I will be like God. You understand what the fall started with. It's pride. I will be worshipped. I will be. And don't work, folks. Don't work. And so there's the tumbleweed. It's blown along. It's got all them things knotted up in it. And how do you get it out? And if you try to get it out, why bother? It's a tumbleweed. It's a dead plant blowing down the ground. So if it had yarn all tangled up in it, and you sat down and you spent two days, three days, three years pulling all of this yarn out, and you had it all pretty and everything else, you've accomplished what? Say it. Nothing. You wasted however long of your life it took you to get that yarn out of there because you're dealing with a dead plant. It's not going anywhere. There's no nutrition in it. Nothing's even going to eat it. And so you just wasted all of this time pulling this out. I don't know about you guys. I use a bait caster every now and again out in my kayak. And when you get a bird's nest, it's like throw it in the lake and get the other rod out. 
I'm not even messing with it. You spend all of that time trying to get out of there. It will make you good at using a bait catcher because you don't want it happening again. So what happens? We come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We get our root back. We get founded in the Word of God. We get our root back. We begin to get watered, cleaning our head up, our spirit up by the water of the Word. Then we get in the sun. We begin to grow. Now what do you find? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians chapter 5. That's the fruit that can be used. The fruit of the Spirit. So that you can be used of God. So that you can be used of God. Now, when we're blowing around, just going wherever the wind would blow us, we got all that junk in there. And if we could clean it up, we can't clean ourselves. See, that's the thing. I don't care how beautiful a tree is. My wife wastes more. Good thing it's not filmed. She's got her camera out all the time. Every tree we go by, slow down. She wants to take a picture. And they're beautiful trees. What's going to happen to them shortly? Lee's going to fall. Guarantee you she will not yell, stop, I want to take a picture of that tree. Is it the same tree? Yes. Same tree. In the spring, it's going to get buds. It's going to go, it does its cycle. It's going to put green on. It's going to, and that's when I'm happy. I like fall, but fall means winter's coming. So I like spring better because that means summer's coming. So here we are. Here's these trees, same trees, just different stage. But if, if a kite, a balloon, anything was stuck in any one of those trees, how does the tree get it out? It can. It needs help. And I think too much of the church world thinks that, that if we work at it hard enough, we can get it right. Let me tell you something. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, you're blowing around with yarn in you for the rest of eternity. We need somebody. We need somebody that can get all the junk out. We need somebody that can get us planted, get the root going. We need somebody that will prune us up and make us into something. And that is what the Lord Jesus Christ is for. And he's never here to destroy you. He's here to restore you. And that's something that has to be. I don't know about you. I've said things I wish I could take back. There are some people that are gone that I'd really like to apologize to because I wasn't always a good man. You know what I found out I can do about my past? Nothing. If I run up and say, Ann, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to say that. I'm Okay, that's going to make me feel better. And how did it change her circumstance? Well, she seems to be, I don't know, Kathy tells me stuff, but she seems to be a pretty good person. And I would think she would look at me and say, well, Pastor, I forgive you. Still didn't change her at all. It didn't take away the hurt. Didn't anything else. But should we apologize? Yes, we should if we've said things. But the idea is it doesn't change anything. So what do we do? We change us. I don't say those things anymore. I, I, I've learned to love. I've learned to have patience. I've learned, I've learned. My wife is like wanting to blow up because we're going to have a great grandkid. I want the baby. <laughs> Get it out. Bring me the baby. <laughs> and I'm going to time it and see how long it takes to say when are they going to come and get their kid <laughs> I'm tired I love little kids I'm just glad they belong to other people <laughs> so I think about this tree and it's got something stuck in it and something that shouldn't be there something that's out of place and it needs some assistance in each and every one of our lives, I don't care how beautiful you are, I don't care what your leaves turn to, I don't care what Miss Clairol has done with the stuff you got on top of your head, it doesn't matter how much makeup we do. I, people go to classes to learn how to put that stuff on. I think all they have to do is see Sue. She'll show it. And you'll be getting the harder it is. <laughs> I don't know if it's harder or we just get to the place where we don't care. <laughs> Leave me alone. This is who I am. But we see, and honestly, no matter what you cover up, if I went in and got one of them spray tans and had my teeth whitened and wear my back brace and stand real tall and all that good kind of stuff, I'm still James Thomas Holbrook, born September 3rd, 1955, 68 years old, and none of that's going to change. 
So I can make the outside look all pretty. <laughs> not going to change the thing. Not going to change the thing. <coughs> and the neat thing is, is he knows me better than I know myself. Oh, listen real close. And he loves me in spite of myself. And he wants to do wonders in our life. And, and the message this morning is really simple. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. I don't care where you fit in intellectually, financially, or any other she that there is out there. The idea is, is that we must be about our Father's business. And we must be doing what the gardener would have for us to do. Pruning is not a pretty process. I was saying earlier, broccoli could talk. Think about it. I wonder what an apple tree would say if I had the dead limbs out there and I'm like, what are you doing? You know that hurts? <laughs> What's wrong with you? It's for your benefit. It's for your good. Scripture says we are grafted in. Anybody in here ever graft a tree? Split that bark, make the nice tea on top, peel it back a little bit. You've got to cut the other limb at about a 45. You're going to stick it down here. Then you're going to put wax on it. You're going to tape it all up. And it's going to take off and it's going to grow. Now, the little sprout that you're putting in here is happy because he's going to get sustenance off of the big one. The big one's saying, what are you doing? I don't know him. I don't like him. <laughs> I don't want him here. This hurts. Now, once he starts growing and producing fruit, that's a little different. Well, look at that little guy. Isn't he neat? Because the pain is past, everything else is past. And when the Lord begins to prune in our life, sometimes he's putting some things in there we may not understand right off the bat, but you will. You will. And let God do his job and let's do ours. Now, I've seen the emotional state of a lot of sinners. Preached a message in the South is preaching a, of all things, I was preaching a tent revival. Many years ago, many, many years ago, many, many, many years ago. They gave an altar call. One old lady came to the front, everybody else just sat there. And I made one statement. I gave a little while go by, somebody was playing the organ, some beautiful soft music. I said, it would be a shame to let a teaspoon of pride send you to hell. And three rather large, burly-looking men got up out of the back and came to the altar and gave their hearts to Christ. Sometimes all we need is somebody to point at where we are, what we're doing, to say we need to grow, we need to learn. We need to get our minds cleaned up a little bit because of, I mean, seriously, what, what do you see now most of the time? You know what this politician done? You know what this one said? You know he cheated on his wife? You know this one stole money? You know, you know, you know. And I know that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, that he's shortly coming again, and the church had better be ready for him when he gets here. It's all according to where you mind it. So we have to be careful of what we put in there, what we talk about. But do you know they're going to put him, they're railroading this guy, they're they're all guilty if you don't know it yet. Every one of them. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I got that in a book. I read that somewhere. We all need a Savior. Now, the sad part is, I just sort of threw politics out there. Guess what? In politics, there's some great men and women of God. There's some people out there that are doing it exactly the way they're supposed to, and God bless them for it. I'll throw that in here. But the emotional state of most sinners, <coughs> when I preach a message, I can see it, I feel it. You see conviction begin to go around, and the Lord starts speaking to your heart about something. And you're thinking, I need saved, but I don't want saved. I need it, but I don't want it. The reason we don't want it is because we want what we want. We think we got it made where we're at. We want to do what we want to do. We don't want to hear anything about what God, the preacher, the church, or anybody else has got to say. We want to live our own life. So we know we need saved. We just don't want saved. And you haven't really taken a good gander at hell yet because it's a place to be avoided. Well, you don't hear that much from behind pulpits anymore. Guess what? There's a heaven to gain. There's a hell to shine. And you get to make the choice. And I can live any way I want. And 
God's just going to overlook it all. It don't work that way. And I think the pruning process, especially within the church, is something that we need to look at. We need to consider. What can I do to better serve him? I don't want to do anything at this point in my life that is displeasing to God. Why? Because I'm a day closer to eternity than I was yesterday, and I take that serious. Just took care of a funeral Monday a week ago. Cause of death, 52 years old. Cause of death, undetermined. He done a full autopsy with no drugs, no alcohol, on any heart damage, when any, don't know, 52. Now for those of you that are younger than that, you think, well man, he lived a good old life. Look at his face, but we didn't. <laughs> 52 years old, undetermined. I've got the vaguest idea. What does that say to me? That says the day that I'm supposed to punch my ticket, I'm punching it, it don't matter. Well, I heard guys years ago get in an argument over calibers of guns. And if you got shot with this, it with this. If you got shot with that, it with that. If you're dead, you don't care. You get shot with a BB gun. If it takes you out, you're dead. It doesn't matter. What does matter is, are you prepared when that day comes? So when the pruning process comes, when you have a day that you think is a bad day, it may be the best day of your life because the Lord may be adjusting something in there that's going to cause you grief down the road, and he's going to fix it now. When you've got that thing in there that's going to bring out patience, what's the scripture say brings patience? Tribulation. There's a couple children I've met. They should have named them Tribulation. <laughs> I won't tell you what they should have named me, but I'm glad they didn't. So God's awesome. He's going to give us wisdom to know what we ought to do. He's going to give us strength to get it done. He's going to anchor us in his word. This is the knowledge. And then he is going to give us the spirit to accomplish. But we have to be willing to walk that road. And that's not easy. Or some of you have gone through some things that, that I know myself. And uh, God bless you, I wouldn't want to walk that road. But as you do, you're going to know something I don't know. You're going to be able to talk to somebody, do something for somebody that's beyond my capabilities because you've been down that road. And what you're going to be able to say is, blessed be the name of the Lord. My God is more than able. And he has done this thing for me. Oh, honestly, you, you guys, some of you have no idea how much I've prayed for some of you for what you've walked through in your life and what you're going through. My father was really good at saying, I'm on an adventure. I'd say, you are. Where are you going? He says, well, I'm just going this way. But he said, I've never been this old before. It's an adventure. Well, guess what? We're all on an adventure. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I do know who holds tomorrow. Let me say that again, and honestly, I got a little more, I got a more for you this morning. The Lord's going to work in each and every one of your lives, and he's going to begin to take the things out that don't need to be there, and he's going to teach us the things that do need to be there, and that's called life. And blessed be the name of the Lord. God's an awesome God. He's going to give me wisdom, he's going to give me strength, he's going to give me perseverance. And I love the scripture. It, it makes things so plain. It says when you have done all that you can to stand, stand therefore. That's powerful words, isn't it? I'm going to hold my place. I'm not going to let the enemy push me. I'm not headed this way or this way. I'm going to follow what the Lord would have. It says when you have done all that you can to stand, stand there. Then it says putting on the whole armor of God. Shows us how to dress to get this standing done. The Lord watches all, or all those that love him, Psalms 145. So my question this morning is how you garden grow? Not the right time of season to ask that, but think about it. We all have garden. How's your garden grow? 
You seeing any new green stuff? Are you learning anything? Are you walking in something new? How's your garden grow? Does it got weeds and thorns? And what did I use earlier? What's blowing across here? Tumbleweed. Tumbleweed. You got a garden full of tumbleweed? What would you do with a garden full of tumbleweed? <coughs> Tell me, Mike, what would you do with a garden full of tumbleweed? Plow them under. See how easy life is? I'd plow them under. Got to be a little nutrient in there. If nothing else, it just keeps the soil broke up. Plow them under. So if you got a garden full of tumbleweeds, let the Lord preach, Mike. Plow them under. <laughs> he keeps he keeps looking at Lisa and saying, "What's he picking on me for?" <laughs> and, and there's another guy over here going, "I think this is funny." <laughs> They're, honestly, yeah, I have done that. You drive them down the road in the car and say, oh, I should have said this. <laughs> so I got you. I got you. So hopefully there's no crabgrass in your garden. That's a whole different subject. I'll preach on that someday. There's, there's no poison ivy in there. My wife wouldn't even work in a flower bed if we had so much poison ivy. She's like, yeah, forget that. Understand in your life and I am all done. Understand in your life there's something growing. It's always growing. You are never going to stop. As long as you're breathing air and you're on this side of the dirt, folks, you're going to grow something. What are you going to grow? What are you going to grow? If you've got sin in your life, I'm going to be just blunt, call it sin, and get to working on it. If there's something in there that is not scriptural, it's not what God would have, call it what it is. Begin to work on it. The only time we have real failures in our life is when we start making excuses for it. Well, I don't think Lucy would do that. <laughs> so I better not do it. She's my example. I've learned how to jump again. I don't jump too high. She taught me how to jump. She likes to wrestle sometimes. I'm not too good at that anymore, but I try. And that lesson I haven't learned yet, I do not yet have a bow in my hair. We're gonna to have to get one of those. But are you willing to trade the old growth for the new growth? Are you willing to let some things go? Honestly, and Cliff told me, and it was hard to believe when he said it, he said, when you retire, you're not going to have any more time than you ever had. And I found out it's actually worse. <laughs> I run all the time. I went two days and didn't even see the poor wife till like way after dark, running here, running there, doing this, doing that. But are we willing to let some old things go so that new growth can come? Scripture says the Lord watches over all who love him. I see watching over you this morning. Let's admit two things. I'm going to pray. We're going to sing a song. Number one, does God love you? Let me see some hands. Come on, be honest. Does God love you? Well, if he loves you, the scripture says he's watching over you. And we fret so much. I don't like what's going on in the world. I see things, but I realize in this book there's nothing I'm going to change. So I'm going to walk into it the best that I can. If we really believe that Jesus is coming, we need to have some new growth. We need to be branching out. We need to get a little stronger in our faith and not be letting things go. Procrastination is one of the worst things in the world. You know, next time I see Kathy, I'm going to tell her. And I may never see her again. I may never see her again. Scripture I use often and in, at gravesides. Whatsoever your hands find to do, do it. There's no doing where you're going. There's not a thing we're going to accomplish here. Not going to change anything. So what I find to do today, I need to do today. I pray that the gardener has spoken to you this morning. I pray that he's going to pull some weeds, trim some limbs. He's going to do things in us to be the most beautiful garden that there ever was. I read in a book that George Washington, during the great conflict, would design gardens that he wanted around his house to help clear his mind. 
they say right now they're some of the most beautiful gardens there that you've ever seen and he had a gardener's heart so when you go home today and if you've got a garden left you're going to see a few things drying up and falling over and guess what spring's coming folks and we'll do it again but in your life let the lord spring up let him bring you light let's pray father i thank you i thank you lord for new fruit father i thank you lord for new ways new strengths new passions Lord, I ask that you would guide each and every one of us, Lord, as your coming is approaching, that we may be about our Father's business, Father, that we may do with a new fervency what you have called us to do. Father, that we renew our relationship with you in a way or beyond anything we've ever known. And that, Father, we would let you be the gardener. We would let you till the soil. We would let you pull the weeds. We would let you prune our limbs and on that great precious day, Lord, we may bear fruit under the kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen.